I'm going to just kick off here. This is lecture number three in my series on my odd take on the Constitution for this year. I'm John Foster. I recognize so many of you that I often forget to say, I'm John Foster. I am a reference librarian here at the library. I have a doctorate in history from the University of Washington. My specialty is really European history, but I started doing these talks a few years ago. My strategy for deciding what to do was try and sort of come up with something that I was interested in reading some more books about. So as it turned out, there were sort of large gaps in my knowledge of American history, as with a lot of people. I mean, we get a sort of, depending on where you go to school and whatever, we get a kind of selective take on, on what's up with American history. So I've learned a lot more about it. Uh, I mean, I knew a fair amount about it, but I didn't really know necessarily so much about this particular topic until I started going into it. So we'll get a little bit more into that. But I wanted to say before I started that I always try and avoid preaching politics from the lectern for the reason that like you're a captive audience. If you want to hear my political views, they can be had for the price of a couple of beers. Um, <laughs> and the more beers, the more views you're going to get. Um, but you know, also be careful what you wish. In the early fall of 1787, the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia broke up. They had come to a document that many of them approved of, although not all. There were 55 delegates at the, at the convention. 39 of them ended up signing it. Some did not. For instance, Elbridge Gerry, who famously said that if the Southerners got to count their slaves to their population, that the Northerners should get to count their horses and cows. But Eldridge Gary, Elbridge Gary also became a very pronounced anti-federalist. By the way, I will just say, there's, it's always funny to me that there's this conservative organization called the Federalist Society, whose who's sort of rise on debt is the opposition to the extension of, of centralizing federalist power, of centralizing federal government power. And I had a friend, a college friend, who was actually very conservative, and who was a... He was a real estate, he ended up being a real estate lawyer in uh, a property owner's rights lawyer in San Francisco and was referred to by the people at the city uh, buildings, Department of Buildings as the Prince of Darkness. Um, <laughs> John was a, he was a great guy. He was a hard guy to argue with for sure. But he always joked that he was gonna start like a, a, a group called the Anti-Federalist Society, which was gonna be pro-government because he thought that the, calling them the Federalist Society was ridiculous, but anyway. So, but Gary became one of a, a group of people who were sort of anti-federalist. And the big sort of takeaway from the Constitution, of the, the sort of document that came out of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, was a pretty massive expansion of federal power over what had been the case under the Articles of Confederation. Under the Articles of Confederation, the government had no right to raise taxes. The government uh, had no right to regulate trade between the states, which meant that New Jersey, which didn't really have a good deep water harbor, was stuck between New York and Pennsylvania, which did. And the governor of New Jersey, I think it was the governor, described it as we're like a, we're like a, a, a barrel that's been tapped at both ends because their, their trade went to either state. And it would get tariff like it would get tariff charged like when it crossed the border into either state. And that was, from their perspective, a very unfortunate state of affairs. At the end of the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin gave this speech. This is not all of it, but I think this is some of the most compelling parts. Mr. President, I confess that there are several points, parts of this Constitution that I do not at present approve. However, I'm not sure that I will never approve of them. That's that's faint praise if you ever heard it. For having lived long, I have experienced many instances of having my opinion changed by better information or fuller consideration. These opinions I once thought right, but found to be otherwise. The older I grow, the more ready I am to doubt my own judgment. I have learned to pay more respect to the judgment of others. Most men, as well as most sects in religion, think themselves in possession of all truth. Wherever others differ, it is they who are wrong. In these sentiments, sir, I agree to this Constitution with all its faults. I doubt, too, whether any other convention we can obtain may be able to make a better Constitution. For when you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you assemble with these men all their faults, their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinion, and their selfish views. From such an assembly can a perfect production be expected? 
It therefore astonishes me, sir, to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does. And he's really making a good point. Okay, the constitutional draft that they came, that came out of Philadelphia in September of 1787 was not perfect. But it was as good as they were going to get. And, to be clear, it fixed a lot of the problems. Now, once again, there's a book by a guy named, I think his first name is Robert, but his last name is Clarman. And his, his book is called The Framer's Coup. It's called that because after the convention that was held uh, in Annapolis in 1786, they came up with this idea. It was James Madison and, and uh, Alexander Hamilton were the sort of two driving forces. Really, Madison was the more intense driving force, as it turns out. To, they, they tried to have this convention. They tried to have a convention between Maryland and Virginia to discuss better navigation for the rivers, better navigation for the Chesapeake. That was meant to be at Alexandria. The governor of Virginia was so opposed to this that he didn't tell the Virginia delegation that it was happening. And so a sort of smaller version happened at Mount Vernon because the Maryland de delegation showed up. There was no one in Alexandria for them to meet with. George Washington let them stay at his house. They had a sort of uh, meeting there with a kind of subset of the Virginia delegates. And then they had this meeting at, Ale at, at Annapolis next year that was meant to be sort of once again trying to sort of overcome some of the problems the sort of coordination problems coordination of trade problems especially that were implicit in the Articles of Confederation the Articles of Confederation made it impossible to do business it made it very difficult because you had to have basically I mean there was one each state got one representative in the Confederation Congress and to get anything done you needed, I think, at least nine votes. But for a lot of it, you needed unanimity. Uh, and you cannot get 13 people to agree on whether the sky is blue. I mean, like, just imagine, imagine your, you know, your condo board or whatever. It's hard to get 13 thinking people to agree on practically anything. So the Constitutional Convention was a sort of, it was a surprise to a lot of people. Uh, Patrick Henry was offered a spot as a delegate uh, from Virginia, and he said no, and uh, with the comment that I smell a rat. So there were a very dedicated group of, of people who were anti-federalists in, in the wake of this convention. And many of them started writing, there's a series called the Anti-Federalist Papers, and it's not quite what the Federalist Papers were. It's a collection of kind of articles, many of which respond to particular articles in the Federalist Papers. But it's sort of kind of fallen into obscurity uh, because the Federalists really won out pretty clearly. But so there were these anti-Federalists, George Clinton being sort of the most well-known, well, Patrick Henry too, George Clinton, who was the governor of New York. So you notice that two of these guys, particularly Patrick Henry, George Clinton, are major figures in two of the most populous states in the Union well, what would come to be the Union, two of the most populous states in the Confederation, let's just say right now. That is, say, George Clinton from New York, Patrick Henry from Virginia. In the wake of the Constitutional Convention, Hamilton and Madison were both very nervous about whether the document was going to be ratified. There was a lot of the sort of chat at the beginning was that people were very suspicious of this document, or people were very dubious that this was going to be an improvement on their situation. And people also viewed their state as their sort of nation in a sense. So that when we get around to the uh, Bill of Rights, it's crucial that the text of the Second Amendment says a free country as opposed to a free state. As a matter of fact, it started out as free state and Madison changed, changed the draft. Also, by the way, let, let me just finish up this topic. In New York especially, New York is, is the physically largest state. It has, I, I believe at this point, the largest population. And it's controlled by two factions. Uh, the Clintons, George Clinton being the leader of the one faction, and the Schuylers. The leader of the Schuyler faction is Philip Schuyler, who, as it turns out, is Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law. His wife was uh, Elizabeth Schuyler. And so Clinton disliked uh, Alexander Hamilton. The feeling was mutual. Hamilton, like in the immediate aftermath of the convention, wrote an article in which he basically said, well, Governor Clinton will never 
will never allow ratification of this. And Madison had to go to him and say, look, that, that's, not, that's not really helping because do you really think that he's going to read that and be like, oh, yeah, well, I should definitely, definitely go along with ratification now. But Hamilton is just one of those guys. I, I really recommend, by the way, and I always say this, watch the, the musical is really well done. Lin-Manuel Miranda, I think, is an absolute genius. By the way, just as an aside, my colleague, Kaylee Williams, who is now the manager of the Lake Branch, said to me, and I think that she is absolutely correct, the fact that when they came out with the, with the COVID vaccine, didn't build a campaign for it based around the, the My Shot number <laughs> from the Hamilton uh, musical, that they absolutely missed one of the great bets in modern American cultural life. But he, he basically based it off Ron Chernow's biography of Hamilton, which is the state of the art. I mean, the only reason why you would read a, a different book about Alexander Hamilton is because the Chernow book is 900 pages long and it's, it's you know, you, they should sell it with a little stand to hold it up because it, I, I listened to it on audiobook as I was sort of driving to and from Shaker Heights to here and uh, it still took me about two months to get through. But it's a great book and it's, this, there's, I doubt, I mean, never say never, but I can't, really can't imagine that anybody's ever going to come out with a better book about Hamilton than that. But if you read that book, and if you read practically anything about Alexander Hamilton, the thing that you will learn is the man could just not leave it alone. He could never leave it alone. And this is why he ended up writing, later in life, a 120-page long pamphlet in which he conceded that he was an adulterer, but that he was not a, a, an embezzler or a stock jobber. <laughs> He did, he did not tell his wife, apparently, until a couple of days before this thing came out, too. I really, that must have been a great dinner table conversation around their house. Um, by the way, honey. Um, so one of the reasons that Hamilton was very nervous about this was that the, the wind was not blowing in a very nice direction in New York. Uh, there, was a, there was a sort of a publication, and I'm trying to remember what it was called, but it was essentially around to ar sort of argue the Clintonian case, in which they used to write argument or, or articles uh, in which they referred to Alexander Hamilton as Tom Shit. <laughs> now, just as an aside, we live in a very polarized country right now, I think much to all of our misfortune, but, but it's not as if this sort of thing is unexampled. And the, the, the example that I always come to is Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. Alexander Hamilton was one of those guys who people either really loved him or really hated him. And the people who hated him really hated him, like Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson really disliked Alexander Hamilton, and Hamilton really returned the the favor with interest. So Thomas Jefferson hired this guy, James Callender, to start a newspaper, the purpose of which was to write bad things about Hamilton. And there's a, there's a letter, if I'm recalling this correctly, from Callender to Jefferson after Hamilton published this pamphlet I was referring to earlier, in which he was like, well, Alexander Hamilton is essentially putting me out of business because I, I really couldn't write anything worse about him than he seems to have written about himself. And of course, he couldn't leave this alone either. So, you know, Hamilton is out in the press uh, arguing for the Constitution by arguing that Governor Clinton is a jerk, which is, in a sense, true. I mean, Clinton, just so to, to frame this for people who, who didn't see the last lecture or were sort of more generally unaware of this topic, Clinton sent three delegates to the Constitutional Convention, one of whom was Hamilton. Two of them weren't, and, but more importantly, two of them were uh, dedicatedly anti-federalist types. I mean, the, the term federalist, anti-federalist, didn't come around until later. But what it meant was that since you voted by state, that Hamilton, first of all, would always be outvoted. Second of all, they left about halfway through the other two guys, and went and told. So the, the, when, they, when they started up the Constitutional Convention, they made an agreement that they weren't going to talk about what their deliberations were about, because they thought that if it was getting chewed over in the press, it would make it harder to come to an agreement, which is probably true. But so when they left, when these two guys left, they went back to Governor Clinton and told him exactly what was going on, which was, it's like, we're not fixing the the Articles of Confederation, we're tearing that stuff up and throwing it in the garbage and starting it anew, which Clint was like, I knew it, you know. <laughs> um, but so what it meant was that Hamilton didn't get to vote because the state of New York did not have a quorum at the convention, although this did not stop him from giving a four plus hour speech <laughs> in the middle of the convention 
much to everybody's chagrin. Once again, I love Alexander Hamilton. He's my, of, of the founding generation, he's, he's my favorite guy. He has flaws, clearly. I mean, he was a skirt chaser. Not as bad as Governor Morris. John Jay once said of Governor Morris, Governor Morris lost his leg in a rioting accident, and John Jay once famously said about him, I, I'm really worried about Governor Morris. It might have been better if he'd lost a different appendage <laughs> in the accident. I'm 100%. I, when I first read this, I was like, no, that's not. But I've read it in like four or five other books, so now I'm convinced it's true. Hamilton comes up with this plan that they're going to write a series of articles in defense of their ideas in the Constitution. So I just thought I'd talk a little bit briefly about the people. So Hamilton first comes up with the idea, and the first person he approaches, interestingly, is Governor Morris. Governor Morris is a smart guy. He was, a, he was at the Constitutional Convention. He was a signer. Governor Morris just says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just too busy. I can't do this. Then the next person that he approached was William Dewar, who's a friend of his. Dewar was a lumber merchant. He had, he had been, he was born in England, and then he had gone to Antigua, I think, and uh, started up a lumber business, and he was actually involved in the lumber trade with Philip Schuyler, Hamilton's father-in-law. He had a very sparkling personality. He was made the Assistant Secretary of State under Hamilton, or Secretary of the Treasury, excuse me, under Hamilton. He submitted three essays, uh, which Hamilton I think decided were not of the appropriate gravity. In fact, it turned out probably to be a good thing that he wasn't involved and maybe for the, would have been for the best if Hamilton had not involved him in anything else for the reason that he was an inveterate financial schemer and ended up using information that he had gotten in the Treasury Department to engage in insider trading, which was truly shocking. This is another thing about Hamilton that's worth knowing. Um, this guy... Whatever else you could say about him, you can agree with his policies, you can disagree with his policies. He was as scrupulous a guardian of public funds as has ever been involved in American government. I mean, he was investigated by his political enemies, of which he had many, on numerous occasions. And generally, his response to this was to provide a report in minute detail about why he was, and as a matter of fact, so when he was about to get blackmailed by Mariah Reynolds' husband uh, in this affair that led to his writing this horrible pamphlet, Mariah Reynolds' husband, so he had gotten sort of honey-trapped by this woman, Mariah Reynolds, and her husband. It's, it's all in the musical. Um, <laughs> but he, he, her husband said, well, you know, you've destroyed our family, for which, like, you know, a certain number of funds, a certain amount of funds would be go some way to repairing things. But also, but eventually Hamilton didn't want to pay anymore. And Mariah Reynolds' husband said, well, I'll release these documents showing that you were involved in some shenanigans. But this stuff had already been invested, investigated. And in fact, when Hamilton talked to his friends about it, they, to a man, said, oh, God, Alice, this, this is yesterday's papers. You've, this has already been, you know, you've already been investigated and cleared for this a long time ago. Nobody cares about this. To which Alexander Hamilton, of course, responded, no, I've got this, and the, the rest is history. But Alexander Hamilton was a very scrupulous protector of the public purse. Like, he really, of all the people who have ever served in government in this country, he was very upright in terms of, of public money. And so it was horrific that Dewar then was involved in a stock jobbing scandal that eventually led to the financial panic of 1792, in which he ended up owing something like two and a half million dollars, ended up spending the last seven years of his life in debtor's prison. Normally, I'm sort of opposed to the idea of debtor's prison since, you know, it's, it's like the mafia, right? Like, why did, why did we kill the guy who owed us all the money? Like, because he can't pay it back. I mean, why do you put the guy in prison if he owes you money? What you really want him is out on the street, like, maybe making some money. But this guy, I think, probably deserved what he got uh, in that case. But anyway, so he was out of the project. And Hamilton brought in James Madison. Madison, once again, had been at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. He was this interesting, diffident little guy. I mean, Hamilton was not the sort of physically largest guy. I mean, those of you who know will know that he, or those of you familiar with his biography will know that he was Washington's aide de camp for a lot of the Revolutionary War and finally sort of engineered a break with Washington because what he wanted was a combat command. There's this famous scene there in some 
farmhouse in New York, sort of upstate New York. Washington lets it be known that he wants to he wants to talk to Hamilton, and Hamilton sort of comes along, and while he's you know on the way, he runs into Lafayette, who's his who's his friend, and they're sort of chatting, and and. Washington shows up at the top of the stairs and says, Colonel Hamilton, you have kept me waiting these 10 minutes. And Hamilton, like, did not apologize, and they ended up having this break, and, and Hamilton left. But what Hamilton wanted and what he got was a combat command. And it was because he wanted to sort of, he, he, his, his feeling was, A, he wanted to sort of show that he could do it. But B, he knew that the way to advancement, that people who had had combat commands were going to be able to advance more than other people. And so he led troops in the storming of the British fortifications in the Battle of Yorktown. Uh, he had immense physical courage, probably too much since if he'd had less, he might have like managed to find a way out of that idiotic duel with Aaron Burr. He, he brings in Madison, uh, who's another fairly voluble character, but from a very different background, you know. So Hamilton is from uh, Nevis in the Caribbean. He comes to the United States sort of basically on his skills as a, as a writer and, and as a sort of merchant. He works for a merchant house down there. Eventually he's, you know, his skill as a writer and his skill sort of running the merchant house is so, becomes so obvious that a group of merchants down there send him up to go to college in the the colonies. Uh, at first he goes to Princeton. It doesn't work out for him there, so he ends up going to Columbia, he got King, which is called King's College at the time, by the way. But Madison is from a completely different uh, sort of background. He's from Port Conway, Virginia. He's the oldest of 12 children, so you know uh, Hamilton is a, a, a bastard. As a matter of fact, uh, John Adams, who really also did not like Alexander Hamilton, once referred to him as a Scotch peddler's bastard, which is true. I mean, uh, unfortunately is true. Madison is from this very sort of well-to-do family in Virginia. They're slave owners, whereas, you know, Hamilton is part of the New York Manumission Society. There's been a, there's been a paper that's been circulating for a few years that, that seeks to show that Madison was more involved, or that Hamilton was more involved with enslavement than had previously been thought. I, I think this is kind of overblown. I think that if you look at the sort of balance of what Alexander Hamilton did, that he was pretty clearly opposed to slavery and actually like worked in concrete ways to abolish slavery. Uh, although he understood, I mean, as the, as the people in the Constitutional Convention did, that uh, they weren't gonna get rid of it right now so it had to be, I mean, this is why the two-thirds compromise is in the constitutional draft, right? And, and so they're sort of looking around for a third guy, and they bring in John Jay. John Jay uh, was born in New York in 1745. He was involved in negotiations with the Spanish over uh, free navigation of the Mississippi. You can see he was, uh, he was a delegate to the, con to the Confederation Congress. He went to King's College. He was the president of the Continental Congress. There we go. Uh, he was minister to Spain in 1779 to 1782. Secretary of Foreign Affairs, later Foreign Secretary. Chief Justice, first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Resigns that position to become the government, governor of New York later on. And I, I happen to be reading this, this biography of John Jay, and I found this, and I, I really think that this says a lot. Today, however, Jay is largely forgotten and sometimes misrepresented. David McCullough, in his biography of, of John Adams, states that Jay was in Spain for a year before Adams arrived there en route to France. In fact, Jay did not arrive in Spain until Adams was on his way out of, this out of the country. Joseph Ellis, in his book on the Founding Fathers, excludes Jay from his list of the eight most prominent political leaders of the early republic, naming instead Aaron Burr, who would be forgotten today if he had not killed Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> Um, and which is true. I mean, let's, let's, let's be clear about Aaron Burr. The guy was a, was a B plus lawyer. Um, and also, Aaron Burr, his, his goal in getting in this thing with Hamilton was to recoup his political career, which is a horrific miscalculation on his part because he then, you know, dueling was illegal. There, there was a reason why it was illegal. But they bring in John Jay. And so. Herein, we come to one of the really interesting stories, one of the few really interesting stories associated with the Federalist Papers. There's a couple of people, I, I've, I read about this for the first time about six weeks ago, and I've been trying not to tell it to people because I didn't want to blow up my A material. Um, <laughs> but, but here's, so John Jay wrote four of the first six federal, Federalist Papers. I think he wrote two through, f two, three, four, five. 
and then he came down with rheumatoid arthritis and he was bedridden for several months. And then in the spring of 1788, he was feeling better. And so he contacted Hamilton and said, you know, I want to get back in the game. And so he writes another one of these essays, number 64. And then we come to this totally bizarre moment in American history. So there was a hospital back in the old days, apparently Broadway and Pearl Street came together at some point, although they don't anymore. There's a hospital there, and there was a medical student in an th operating theater with other medical students who was doing, who was dissecting a cadaver. Now, this was the days before the adoption of the germ theory, so there were open windows, and some of the local kids had cr climbed up a ladder and were looking through. And it, to shoo them away, <laughs> it's, it's still hard for me to believe that this happened, the medical student waved the cadaver's arm at them and said, this is your dead mother's arm. So it turned out that one of these kids' mothers had died recently. So he runs off home and tells his father. And his father goes to the cemetery. And as it turns out, this was not the person being dissected at this point, but the grave had, in fact, been robbed, which was a problem in those days. I mean, grave robbing was, you could, you could, be executed for it, but on the other hand, it was worth a lot of money. So an angry mob forms, as they will at times like this, and they go to the hospital and cause such a ruckus that the uh, doctors and medical students have to be lodged in the city jail for their safety. Well, the next day, an even larger mob forms, and they manage to go up to Columbia, which if you've ever been to New York, that's a long way. I mean, if you're going to ride the 1-9 up the west side, that's still about half an hour. I mean, okay, there's a fair number of stops unless you take the express, but, you know, and I can just tell you from having been around the occasional angry mob that it's hard to, you know, to, to continue your angry mobness if you've got a long way to go, right? I mean, it's, you know, at a certain point, you're just like, well, it's, it's getting kind of, kind of late. Like, can we have lunch and maybe pick up the mob thing later? Um, but so they get up to Columbia, they get up to King's, and uh, Alexander Hamilton is there on the porch. He's heard that they're coming, and he got uptown too. I mean, he lives, his office was down on Wall Street, but they run by him. Fortunately, everybody had been cleared out. So go back down to the jail, where there's a real, uh, a real riot going on. There's like stones being thrown. Anyway, so John Jay comes walking out his front door, none the wiser, and he sees the general for this, who runs the city militia go running by. And he says, you know, he knows him. And he says, well, what's going on? And the general says, oh, you know, there's, there's this riot going on. It's total chaos. And John Jay says, well, hold on a minute. And he runs back inside and he gets a couple of swords and he gives one to the general and he takes one himself. So they go down to the jail where like total chaos has broken out. At one point, one of these angry rioters in a sort of prefiguration of the, of the January 6th tried to climb through the window of the jail and was promptly shot dead by the militia. So there's, there's lots of rock throwing going on, and John Jay catches one in the head, and it opens him up, and he nearly dies. They thought he was going to, he was in, he was bedridden for five days. They thought he was going to die, or they thought he was going to die for about five days. He was bedridden for a while after that. Also, General von Steuben, the, the Revolutionary War general from Germany, also got hit with a rock and incapacitated. And finally, things got to such a pass that... That, I'm sorry I'm laughing about this because what I'm about to say is not funny. Like the, the militia opened fire on the crowd and killed between four and 20 people, which really dissipated people's interest in further rioting. Uh, but in any case, the sort of like postscript to this is that this head doctor at the hospital had to take out a full page ad in the newspaper in which he said, I have not personally, nor I have I ever through an agent, caused bodies to be dug up from any cemetery in the city limits, <laughs> which excluded what was in those days referred to as the Negro burial ground. Today we would not use such a term, but also the potter's field. So what he was essentially saying was, we're not digging up any white people, um, which apparently resolved the situation. But in any, in any case, that's why John Jay didn't write any more Federalist essays. By the time he got over this like horrific head wound that he had received in what's come to be called the doctor's riot. This was in April of 1788, the, the, the thing was done. Now I will say, I read this about this about six weeks ago, 
in, this, in, a, in a book, and I read it, and I was like, no, th this can't possibly, I mean, the waving the arm, like, that's a weird, that's a weird detail, right, to have come down to us from 1787 or 1788. But in fact, it had read about it in like four other books. It's a thing that happened. And it's just, it's absolutely, you know, in, in a way it makes the whole, the whole project of doing, of doing talks about the revolutionary period worthwhile because <laughs> like now I know that. Now I know that about American history. So they start writing collectively under the name Publius. Publius was the name of a figure in Roman history. You'll notice that whenever people want to add a kind of cultural heft to what they're doing in colonial America, they always take on Roman names, never Greeks or seldom Greeks. It's, it's mostly Romans. So uh, George Clinton, when he write, wanted to write these anti-federalist essays, called himself Cato. There was also Brutus. Brutus was one of uh, Publius Valerius uh, Publicola's uh, associates. They revolted, the, there were four of them, and they led a revolt against Tarquinius Superbus, who was the seventh and last king of Rome. They deposed Tarquinius, Tarquinius and he was exiled. They established the Roman Republic, which is the sort of kind of model that they had for what a republic was, was going to be all about. And this is another reason why Hamilton wanted Adams, or wanted Madison as part of the project. Because to prepare for the Constitutional Convention, Madison had acquired every book that he could about republics as they had existed up to the mid-1780s and read them all. I mean, he made himself the, the sort of ruling expert or the leading expert in the world on the topic of, of historical republics, which most people thought I mean, th these people were very uh, influenced by Montesquieu. Montesquieu, the French political theorist, had basically said, well, you can have Republican work as long as it's kind of small, right? Like Geneva. Geneva, it's small, it's homogenous. You can have a republic in somewhere like, you know, or the Swiss cantons or whatever. But if you're going to have a big polity, then a republic just isn't going to work. I mean, that was like, that was one of the sort of big ideological uh, fences that they had to overcome. But so anyway, Publius was the, he became one of the first, he, I think he was the third consul uh, in the Roman Republic. He led troops at the Battle of the Sylvian Forest. He led troops in the victory over the Sabines, the victory over Clusium. And then he renounced his political offices and then he died. But he was sort of viewed as a model of civic patriotism, if you will. And that's why they take on this name. They want to, and it's funny too because they act as if in letters as if they're not doing it. So there's a certain point at which I, I think the, the way this went was that Hamilton wrote a letter to Madison in which he wanted to communicate to Madison that because of his legal practice he was going to have to sort of step back for a little while and he was like well you know it may be the case that Publius will you know, with the circuit court being in session or something like that. Like, but he, he made it seem, even to Madison, who was also working on the project, as if they were not doing it. But the, and the reason they did this was because what they wanted to do was frame their political arguments, right, in a way such that it wasn't about, like, number one, it wasn't coming from Alexander Hamilton because nobody liked him, um, which is not really true. But, but a lot of people really disliked him, right? So what he wanted to do, and what they all kind of wanted to do was, deflect attention from it being about this person's argument and just sort of say, this is what the argument is. Look at it and look at it on its own merits, if you can. So what the Federalist Papers are is a set of 85 essays. They're between four and six pages long, each one. They were published in New York papers. They circulated to other places a bit, but they mostly were published in New York. There's been some speculation over the years as to who wrote which thing. There's some, it's obvious, but they were all unsigned, right? So what's happened subsequently is they've gone through with kind of scientific analysis and looked at what kind of patterns are in them. At a certain point, both Madison and Hamilton took credit for certain ones, in some cases manifestly incorrectly. But they've gone through and systematically looked at, at like, 
because every person has their own pattern of speaking and writing. And they've just, they've just taken computers and gone through, and they're, they're pretty sure they know who wrote which thing. So uh, Hamilton wrote 51 of the 85, number 1, 6 through 9, 11 through 13, 15 through 17, 21 through 36, 59, 61, and 65 to 85. So he sort of took it. I mean, and when you see like the frequency with which these things are coming out, it's amazing. I mean, they were doing about three a week to the point that their opponents, there's, you know, letters between their opponents were like, oh my God, it's enough already. Like, you know, we can't, you know, you've just gone on about this. It's overwhelming. Madison wrote 29, 10, Federalist number 10, which is, we'll talk a little bit about, we'll talk about a few of these, but 10 is really the main, is the most famous one. 14, 18 through 20, 37 through 58, and then 62 and 63. Jay wrote 2 through 5, and then 64, before he was nearly brained. So Hamilton sort of specifies at the beginning what the topics are going to be. The utility of the union to your political prosperity, covered in 2 through 14. Uh, the insufficiency of the present confederation to preserve that union. There's a, there's a really great series of lectures. There's a professor at Princeton, and her name is just escaping me right this minute. But if you put in like Princeton Revolutionary War lectures, like her whole lecture course is up there, and she's a lot smarter than I am. But one of the points that she makes is that we get kind of a jaundiced view of the, of the Articles of Confederation because, like, because these are so popular, because the Federalist Papers are such a part of our kind of intellectual history in the United States. And basically, they were essentially put together to hammer, to, to make the point of what a terrible uh, system the Confederation was. The necessity of a government at least equally energetic with the one proposed the attainments of this object. The conformity of the proposed constitution to the true principles of Republican government. That's a key one. That's why it's in red. Um, and that's why 37 to 84, right? So that's, that's a large proportion of what's going on here. The analogy to your own state constitution. Why that? Well, because what they're trying to say is, look, the constitution that we've come up with is not all that different than the constitutions that you're living under in your state already. We're just moving the sort of level up one level. And the additional security which its adoption will afford the preservation of that species of government to liberty and prosperity, covered in number 85. Something of an afterthought, but, but it's, it's in there. One is just the introduction. Federalist number one. This is one of my favorite Hamilton lines. It has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country, by their conduct and example, to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitution on accident and force. And this is a key idea, right? So the US Constitution, and the, the state that, that was established by it, the state that we live in now, is a really sort of optimistic wager, if you want to characterize it that way, that we can organize our affairs systematically. So it's not like the British Constitution, which isn't really a constitution, but the British Constitution, for those of you who haven't heard me go on about this, there isn't a written British Constitution. They have no written constitution. Their constitution is a series of documents or a set of documents that have just sort of come down historically and that are kind of the reference points. It's not sort of systematically composed like the U.S. Constitution is. The U.S. Constitution, the, when the British talked about their constitution, they, they really meant their constitution almost like, you know, I have a strong constitution because I run every day. There really was that element of it. This is really the first written constitution, the first constitution in the modern sense of a, of a unitary document on which, on which the government of a state is going to be based. And it's, there's a sense in which it seems a little old hat to us. I mean, not to say that we don't have like very like profound arguments about it, but it just seems normal to us, right? Like we all grew up with a settled constitution. You can think, well, some parts of it are better than others. And, oh, I hate this part and I wish they changed it. Or, but we all sort of, there's this kind of set of rules, and the, the, we all have this kind of, or most of us, maybe not everybody, but most of us have this kind of meta-consciousness about it. That is to say, we agree that it's legitimate. Like, we accept that the source of sovereignty is the people and 
that popular sovereignty, sovereignty is expressed in the, in the document of the Constitution. So we start from the premise that this document is, is legit. If somebody's out there going like, well, we should get rid of the US Constitution, come up with some other form of government, that's just not gonna make it with anybody of, of any political stripe. I mean, maybe a few wing nuts here and there, but, but, but basically, we accept this as the kind of, as the thing to debate about, right? So just to take, and not to necessarily take one position or another on this, but the Second Amendment, we've spent a lot of time arguing about what the Second Amendment means. The chances that at any point the Second Amendment is gonna disappear from the US Constitution is pretty much zero. I mean, there, there have been amendments to the US Constitution, obviously we all know what they are, I mean, starting with the Bill of Rights. But we take this as, and, and you know, they made it hard to change for a reason, right? So you don't wanna have just like, ah, I'm really sick of this part of the Constitution, let's get rid of it. Like, it's, there's a reason why it's hard to change the Constitution. Also, just as an aside, the Constitution is a kind of interesting living document. So for instance, I was talking about this with one of the people in the audience now after recent talk, the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, I think is correct in the spirit of the Constitution. I think it's correct in the spirit of human justice, honestly, also. But it, what it's based on is a really tortured reading of the Interstate Commerce Clause. You know, you look at that and you're like, wouldn't the Equal Protection Clause have been like more obvious place to start with? But whatever, you know, it's settled law now. Um, but it's, you know, but it's sort of, L right, yeah. <laughs> it's an illustration of the way the document lives. Like the, the lawyers at the Justice Department looked at that and were like, well, how are we gonna get this done? The Interstate Commerce Clause and the fact that it's a weird reading of it, in the same way the Second Amendment, the reading of the Second Amendment's current the Supreme Court, I think is pretty weird. Um, but once again, it works in the same way. Like if you think that if you think that the outcome is, is commensurate with the, the sort of spirit of, the, of what the document is trying to do, then the fact that that reading is a weird reading is, is, is more an instance of the Constitution being a living document than just you know, a whack reading of it, so to speak. Anyway, we can, there's way more to say on that topic, much of which I don't want to get into because I don't want to start us all grousing at each other. Which is, by the way, I spend like not so much anymore. I used to spend a lot of time out of the country because I would be doing research, my doctorate. And like, I really, I loved being in Germany. I had a lot of fun in Germany. But I really love coming back to the United States because the fact is, because I'm a signed on member here, like, I get to grouse about it. We all do. That's the great thing about being Americans. We all get to grouse about the way the country is and the way it's, you know, we all get to say. So that's the magic of this country. Nobody can take away your right to beef yet. <laughs> Until my regime comes to power. <laughs> um, Federalist number 10 is the most cited, most remembered of the Federalist papers. It was written by Madison, James Madison. Among the numerous advantages promised by a well-constructed union, none deserve to be more accurately developed than its tendency to break and control the violence of faction. And if you want to talk about things with a kind of connection to American life as we are currently living it, Madison's writing in number 10 is crucial. And what he basically wants to say is, you know, a faction is a group, it can be a majority, it can be a minority, but who is more concerned with their own interests than they are with the general interests of the country. And this is a problem, one of the big criticisms that the anti-federalists made about about the Constitution was, well, you're never going to get rid of faction. And the bigger the, the bigger the political entity, the more factions you're going to have. The more chance there's going to be for these subgroups who care only about themselves, their own interests, rather than the sort of interests of the country writ large. And it's an interesting question, too, because if you look at how representative government works, so there, there's kind of two theories, right, about how representative government is supposed to work. On the one hand, the representative is just kind of mouthpiece of their constituents. So, you know, we here in Cuyahoga County elect X person, and we tell them what we want, and then they're a representative. 
So that's, that's one sort of extreme, right? And the other extreme is we elect a person who we think is a kind of a right person, and they go and do what their political judgment tells them to do, right? But neither thing is really right. It's not going to be effective to have somebody who's just a sort of robotic mouthpiece of their constituents. A, because their constituents probably also have many different views. But B, because the art of government, if you will, is the art of debate and compromise. So, but at the same time, you don't want somebody who's just like, wow, I'm in power now. Okay, so Madison thinks that there are two ways that you can, that you can avert the damage caused by faction. One is to remove its causes, and the other one is to control its effects. Well, the causes of faction is liberty. So Madison says, well, no, we can, like getting rid of liberty would be, would be a cure that's worse than the disease, right? So we can't, we can't do that. So, and we can't really fully control its effects, but what he wants to say in Federalist Number 10 is that the system of government that we have, that we're, that we're coming up with, that's a federal system, that is to say, that has one sort of superordinate power, gives us the best chance of developing a kind of consciousness that's a sort of overarching consciousness, which is the one that we need, right? So the, the, the consciousness that we need to have is a kind of a consciousness valuing of the totality of the country rather than just sort of like, well, you know, I want this, and so I want to like, I want to like reconfigure the laws to, to make to my own advantage. But so the, the key here is once again to try and come up with a system of government that promotes this kind of overarching thinking as opposed to as opposed to kind of uh, pure pure self-interest. Federalist number 33. What is a power but the ability or faculty of doing a thing? What is the ability to do a thing but the power of employing the means necessary to its execution? This is a prefiguration, and not surprisingly, this is Alexander Hamilton, of what's called the theory of implied powers in the Constitution. And it basically goes like this. If the Constitution says that the government has a power to do something, it's also implied that it has the, the right to use the means to do it, too, as long as those means don't vary too far from the norms of the political culture. That, I mean, the devil is in the details there, but there's, what is the name of the, of the clause in the Constitution? The, is it right and proper? There's an article in the Constitution that basically says the government has, can make the, whatever laws are like, right and proper to governing the country. The necessary and proper clause. Necessary and proper clause. And what he's mostly talking about is taxation. And by the way, occasionally someone will come near the reference desk and say, well, you know, the Constitution doesn't give the government the power of taxation. Yes, it does. It gives it no other power. It gives it the power of taxation. Because that's what they were trying to fix with the, with the Confederation. That was one of the big problems. Once again, the, one of the bases of the American Revolution was no taxation without representation. And as I invariably say at times like this, people do not like taxation with representation. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, you know, as the Constitution is now, the government has the right to do it. It doesn't say how much, but they do have the right to do it. But Hamilton, who everybody thought was a sort of crypto-royalist, and they were not exactly wrong about that. I mean, on the basis of the speech he gave at the Constitutional Convention in which he basically said that the English political system was the best one uh, and that we should have a president for life which probably seemed like a better idea when the guy who was probably going to be in the office was Washington. Um, I, I have a hard time thinking of too many people I'd like to see president for life in the, in the current political environment in this country. But, but also, I just don't want to see president for life because, once again, like submitting yourself to the voters periodically is a, kind of a reality check, or should be. But... This is once again, Mad or why do I want to call him Madison? I know he's Alexander Hamilton. He has that wonderful visage. Um, Madison was kind of an elfin little fellow. Uh, Hamilton was not very big. I mean, nobody was very big back then. I once went to the, there's a, there's a cemetery outside of Boston where like the Lowell's and whoever else are buried and they're all about that big. I mean, they're like really, really, people used to be tiny. 
But Hamilton, once again, coming out for his very pronounced federalist interpretation of the Constitution. He's very much about the virtues of centralizing power. He's okay with some power being devolved to the states, but this is the sort of basis of the conflict that would later arise between him and Madison. He and Madison became real political opponents. And it tells you something about the sort of uh, the, the basis on which the country is put together is look at the beginning at the early presidents of the United States. Washington, where's he from? Virginia. Jefferson is from Virginia. Adams is from Massachusetts. Madison, the fourth president, is from Virginia. They're, they're predominantly Southerners. The Southerners have this sort of population advantage because they get to count two thirds of their enslaved population. But then after the Civil War, that kind of goes away and we don't get another Southern president until Wilson. And even Wilson, Wilson was a president of Princeton before he was, so he sort of got his like Northern bona fides in a certain sense. But once again, there's a reason why, you know, the South gets very out of favor after 1865, not with, I mean, personally, I'm also very comfortable with that. But you know, like start a rebellion, that's the outcome. Especially if you're starting a rebellion in favor of slavery, which as General Grant called it, one of the worst causes that anyone ever fought for. This is another great line. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. This is Madison, but writing in a very Hamiltonian vein. And I, I wanna read the whole passage actually, because I think it's really, this is I think one of, the, one of the really best pieces of American political discourse. The interest of the man must be connected to the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing the government, which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed. In the next place, oblige it to control itself. <laughs> a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. <laughs> so once again, here's, here's Madison, who's a real political realist. I mean, I, I don't have the sort of like kind of emotional feeling for Madison uh, that I do for Hamilton. I have to admit, partly it's because I have this like northerners loathing for the South. Um, I apologize to any Southerners who may watch this. Like I have, I, I went to library school at the University of North Carolina. I like, I know many people live in the South and there are lots of wonderful people there. I think the whole Confederate heritage is pretty gross. Um, for the enslavement thing, if for nothing else. But Hamilton, or but Madison, God, I cannot get the founding fathers right. <laughs> Madison, he's here sort of saying like, look, you know, we have to be realistic about what kind of government we're gonna have and what government's supposed to do. And um, one of the sort of checks on government has to be the power of the people to, to call it to account. But we also have to have these sort of separate power basis in the government to, for the government to internally check itself. If, if you ask, you know, why do we have this system of checks and balances between the three branches of government? It's because the government, if you, if you have the government as sort of like one unitary entity, it has the capacity because of its control of the institutions of the state to shut down internal debate, to exclude certain kinds of people, certain views, what have you. Um, so what we need is both. We need popular, popular sovereignty. We also need the checks and balances within the different branches of government so that the government, you know, so that no group sort of has it all one way, I guess is the best way of saying it. I included this, not because I think Federalist 46 is necessarily that great, but it's the last one that Jay wrote before he took the rock to the head. <laughs> and Jay is a really fascinating guy. I've, I've actually just been reading this biography of Jay and I knew very little about him before that he really is kind of, I say the forgotten founding father. Hamilton was kind of the forgotten founding father until the musical came out. Um, I mean, mostly, if you'd asked people 10 years ago what they could remember about Alexander Hamilton, it's like, you know, he got shot by Aaron Burr. Which is really unfortunate, too, because all these other guys sort of, you know, Jay lived into the 1820s, uh, Madison lived into the 1820s, 
they, they sort of had a chance to sort of create their legacy, whereas Hamilton gets killed sort of while he's still in the prime. He's, he's a bit out of, out of the sort of uh, main train of government by that point. His faction has kind of gotten moved aside. But who's to say that he couldn't have made a comeback? I mean, he, at least he would have tortured people with, you know, like 11, 12, you know, 2,000 word tracts on whatever, so. Um, but there are a few people who will not admit that the affairs of trade and navigation should be regulated by a system cautiously formed and steadily pursued, and that both our treaties and our laws should correspond with and be made to promote it. So one of the big sort of issues that was facing the nascent United States uh, under the Confederation, uh, the Articles of Confederation, is that, first of all, the British were not living up to their end of the deal. To be honest, neither were we. The British had said that they would remove their forts on the western frontier, which they had not done. The British were also excluding us from the, carry the Atlantic carrying trade. So uh, we also were not fully conversant in our responsibilities. But one of the, another big problem was that, and I was mentioning this at the beginning, was that states would tariff block each other, or that states would try and outbid each other for certain aspects of, of, the, of the Atlantic trade, which the British were excluding us from lots of parts of. So basically, most of our trade went with them, went to them. We were excluded from the carrying trade, which meant that we didn't have a sort of, uh, that's, that's basically where your navy comes from. One reason you want to have a lot of sailors around is that when you need to have your navy, like, you know, Joe Schmo, who's been working on a farm in Arkansas, may be good at many things, and he probably can fire a musket, but he doesn't know how to splice the main brace or, you know, take your pick of naval terminology. Um, but so Federalist 64, a lot, of, a lot of it is about the Senate, but it's also about the sort of unitary power of government to present a kind of unified face. I mean, this is what the, what the British were really hoping. It's, it's very clear that this was the case, is that the American Union would fall apart and it could deal with the little bits piecemeal. Uh, and what American federalism was meant to do was prevent that. We got problems, but let's sort them out. You know, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a football team, right? Like, I have a problem with this guy or that guy. Let's work that out in the locker room, right? Instead of airing it in the press or in front of the other team. Because if the other team gets wind of it, that gives them an advantage over us. If, they, if the other team can see cracks in us, that gives them an advantage. So what's basically American federalism is meant to, to remedy is this, is this sort of centrifugal tendency, so to speak. All right. So. A couple of things to say about the significance of the, of the Federalist Papers. Number one, some historians argue that they were not that significant at all. For the reason that they were only mostly really available in New York. They all came out in New York papers, even after Madison went back to Virginia. The article still just came out in the uh, New York papers. And here's the thing, you, of course you cannot see this, so I'm going to have to read it to you. My apologies, because it's tiny. So the deal with the, con with the Constitution was, with ratification, uh, they agreed that if nine states, well, as soon as nine states ratified it, it would come into force. So Hamilton is really nervous about New York. So Federalists 1 through 17 come out between late, the end of October and the 5th of December, 1787. 7th of December, Delaware becomes the first state to ratify. Federalist 18 through 20, 7, December 7th to December 11th, then December 12th, Pennsylvania. Now we've got two. Federalist 20 and 22, middle of December, 18th of December, New Jersey becomes number three. Federalist 23 through 28 and 30 through 31, 29 was written in there but didn't get actually published until a little bit later. Eight, December 18th to December 26th, on the 2nd of January, Georgia becomes number five. So January 2nd to January 8th, Federalist 32 to 35, then on January 9th, Connecticut is number six. Federalist 29 finally comes out on the 9th of January. And then 36 through 50 come out between January 9th and February 5th. So in the space of a month, that's 14 of these essays. So essentially one every two days. 
Massachusetts ratifies, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. The Federalist 51 through 77, February 6th to April 2nd. Then uh, Maryland ratifies on the 28th of April, South Carolina on the 28th of May, Federalist 78 and 79 on the 28th of May. Then the 21st of June, New Hampshire ratifies, that's nine, right? Okay, so why not stop there, right? Well, a couple of reasons. A, look at the two states who have not, there's three more, there's three more states that have not ratified. One is Virginia, one is New York, one doesn't matter. One is Rhode Island, nobody cares. Um, <laughs> Rhode Island doesn't ratify until May of 1790. And by that, and I think that the only reason they ratified was because they didn't think they were gonna, they thought they might be excluded from the club, which whatever you think about the United States by that point, you want to be in, you want to be on the inside looking out rather than, rather than the other way. But so, we still have five more uh, Federalist essays that get published between the 21st of June and uh, the 13th of August. And the last one is published after New York ratifies. So Virginia and New York, the two most populous states. It's possible that New York will just say, forget it. We're going to be our own country because New York is big enough to do it. And likewise, Virginia. Virginia had a little harder time given the way that it's fixed geographically. But Virginia is a very populous, very economically well-developed state. So, and Virginia is home to many of the uh, most profound anti-federalists. And let me just tell you a little story about how this is going that relates to some other stuff. When the Second Amendment was being, like before the Second Amendment, Patrick Henry gave a speech in the Virginia House of Burgesses in which he said, what the Northerners want to do is prevent us is like prevent us from having our own military forces so we cannot police our slaves and i mean he said this out loud and there's an argument that people make and you yourselves can judge whether it's valid there's there's some there's some stuff on the other side too like the bill of the bill of rights which resolves this by with the second amendment um, comes around later, and it's debatable whether the Second Amendment is a direct response to that. I mean, Madison actually says to Patrick Henry, dude, just calm down. Like, it's not, you're getting a little over, overwrought here. So there's a very pronounced consciousness in the Virginia House of Deputies about what the sort of potential divisions, regional divisions, within the country might be. Now, once again, there's, there's a number of, of books about this, and I urge you, uh, rather than uh, determining that I'm some sort of snowflake to, to go out and read them because I don't like I think there's arguments to be made on both sides of this issue and I you know I take really no position on it except to say that Patrick Henry did say the words out loud I mean it wasn't like just something he thought like he said it out in, in public but the Constitution is finally ratified New York ratifies on the 26th of July 1788 Rhode Island they ratified they only ratified by two votes or I think 66 people in the uh, Rhode Island legislature, and it was like 34 to 32 or something like that. It's like, Rhode Island, come on. People have always been like this. Um, but so, okay, so the Federalist Papers, this is why it's, it, they're interesting, I think. Um, I, 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 I strongly suggest that people read them. They're underread. They're actually really well written, really entertaining. They're short, so you're not committing to reading like 800 pages of impenetrable. I mean, they were written in the late 18th century, so people had a little trouble getting to the point. But they've been, they are the, the document outside the Constitution that's been referred to in the most Supreme Court decisions. I think it's been uh, the first time it was mentioned in a Supreme Court uh, decision was 1792, maybe? 1790 or 1792. And it's been mentioned more than 290 times in Supreme Court uh, decisions, which is interesting when you consider that it's not like an official document of the country, right? This is sort of like political journalism, 
but it's political journalism that's basically meant to explain why the Constitution is the way it is. And you can read it and say, well, I disagree with this, I disagree with that. But I think it's unlikely that you will read any part of the Federalist Papers and just think, whoa, that is loopy. Like, these, these are guys who spent a lot of time thinking about how it is that the country is going to come together. These are guys who really have a stake in the game, really have a skin in the game. I mean, Hamilton has, has risked life and limb, uh, Jay has risked life and limb, to be part of this, to create this political entity. I suppose the thing that I would say, you know, once again, as, I, as everyone is aware, there's a, a great deal of polarization in the country, but we probably could do a lot worse than getting back to the original documents and reading them and talking about them as opposed to just sort of arguing with each other in the abstract or just talking to each other because we agree with, you know, talking to people you agree with. It's a lot, it's a lot healthier reading things you disagree with than reading things you agree with. Um, and maybe I'll leave you with that thought. <laughs> Um, in the event that anyone has questions, I can certainly answer them. I will just say also that in, we're in August now, right? Yes. It's August, so in October, I believe, we're, the last episode of this talk series is going to happen, and it's going to be on the Civil War Amendments, 13, 14, and 15. It's going to be a collaborative presentation with me and Todd Arrington from the Garfield House. Um, I, I'm looking forward to this. I'm also a little, like, I've got to kind of be on my game because Todd is really good. <laughs> I love that guy, but I also hate watching his talks because it makes me feel bad about myself. Um, but so anyway, I'll, like, uh, you can get, it'll, it'll be in the cover to cover. It's, I, I think it's the 11th of October, but I'll find out the exact date and uh, you'll have lots of warning. And it's going to be really interesting. It's, it's our sort of like, you know, when I, when I wanted to do a, a sort of series of talks about the Constitution, I didn't want to do the sort of same old thing. And I think that uh, especially like those Civil War amendments really reconfigure what the country is about and really shape what the country is right now in ways that, that, that continue, to, continue to evolve. So uh, I, I, I would love to see you all at that. And, uh,